California, the Sunshine State, the Silicon Valley, the global trendsetter in popular culture, innovation and politics, the engine of the United States of America. If it were a country, California would be the fifth largest economy in the world. And with cities such as Los Angeles, San Diego, San Francisco and Sacramento, it's the most populated state in the entire country. And LA, as it turns out, is the second most populated city after New York. Nicknamed the City of Angels, it has a population of over 13 million people, a global city, renowned as the home of Hollywood, the world's number one entertainment center, where the stars feel most at home. And cruising down Sunset Boulevard to Beverly Hills and then Venice Beach, it's a picturesque postcard city, the envy of the world. But as you go past the flashing lights and lavish mansions, you continue south and you come to an area just as historical, but for all the wrong reasons. South Central LA, the projects, the hood, Compton Avenue, Imperial Courts, Nickerson's, Hacienda. To most, these names sound just like any other neighborhood. But in LA, these were battlefields, trenches and final resting places, where murder and violence were out of control where the longest standing gang war took place between the most infamous Bloods and Crips. It's actually kind of like ground zero in the gang war. This is where all the violence is at, this is where all the murders is at. It's like we got the worst statistics, period. The highest poverty rate, highest disease rate, the lowest income, you know, these projects, you know, so everything else is the worst. So you grew up gangbanging. When I grew up around here, it was always a whole lot of shooting killing from everybody. Uh, we grew up in one of them kind of areas where everybody, you know, everybody tough, everybody rough. Uh, you couldn't come outside being weak hearted. Uh, it's a lot of uh, projects. We all like in one area, so it was, it's it's really nowhere to go without running into somebody that you don't really like or don't like you. Uh, it was just more like this. It's like mayhem. If you went from your area, you stay in your area, or you know, you get something happen to you. You get killed. You get shot. You get beat up. Um, they chase a lot of people home, rob you a lot of your jewelry, disrespect you a lot. You know what I mean? Make you feel less of a person. If anybody came around the community that we didn't like or we didn't know, uh, you know, we attacked them. Uh, we did what they did to us, basically. It ain't no one story, because it was every day, every day, every day. You know, we live right here, it's Crips live over here, Crips live over there, Crips over here, over there, we blood, so. You know, everywhere you go, you step out of bounds, you gotta be ready. Where you at right now? Th this is owned by this banner right here. This banner is Eastside Grace Street Wise Baby Low Crip, you feel me? That's my hood, this is, uh, this where you at. If you've seen the movie Minutes to Society, that's where they filmed this filmed the movie at right here in the Jordan Down Project. So this rag, if you see anybody with this around here, then you know they represent this gang right here. But when it comes to gang banging, it really don't, your personal opinion really don't matter. You know what I'm saying? It, 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 all, it all depends on what your gang is talking about. So if, if, if this is a gang two blocks away from us and, and our hood say we not cool with them, then from since I was young, raised up as a kid, I've been raised to not like these people and we not cool with them. So whenever I see them, it has to be some type of physical altercation, uh, fight, you know, stabbing, shooting, something like that. Those type of things happen when you come across people like that. But you kind of like taught since birth, that type of thing. A lot of people don't understand this, but a lot of people, they think that, oh, you, are, I want to become a crip. Oh, I want to become a blood. But the reality is, you grew up into it. I was in elementary school. I was claiming Grave Street, you know, because it's written on the walls and everybody around me claiming Grave Street, right? I ain't no gangbanger. I'm in the elementary school. I don't got no guns. But, but at the same time, older people in the neighborhood, they say I need a dollar for ice cream or, or icy or anything. It's the older people that's gangbanging that's giving it to me because, you know, they my neighbors, you know, and they're giving it to me. So as I'm growing older, still in elementary school, I, you know, they might got shot. Like, oh, he got killed. And they, like, the bloods killed him. Or whoever killed him, an uh, enemy. So automatically, I'm gonna automatically grow up not liking whoever did that. Oh, the police shot him. So I'm gonna have that, that, that little thing against the police. Yeah, it was rough. 
every day. We had to fight every day, going in, going out. We had to worry about the police throwing us in the car, dropping us off in the Nickerson, or the Imperial Court. We had to worry about other housing developments. We had to worry about other gangs outside the projects and stuff like that. So it was real competitive, the dog eat dog, and everybody was in poverty. Growing up poor in Watts, I didn't have no clothes, so now I'm gonna go to junior high. I went to Nikes and the Pumas and Adidas, but I don't got no money. So only thing I could do, more than likely, what I'm gonna do is start robbing, breaking the houses, trying to get the, the clothes. I wanna be first day of school fresh. You know, I'm gonna see the first blood, so I know I'm gonna have my first gang fight. I'm already in the mix. I don't know what come with it. I don't know the jails. I'm gonna be on cow gang. I don't know none of this. I just know I'm your gang bang. I'm trying to earn a rep, earn a, earn a name for myself. Just like everybody else, my peers around me. The more known you is, the cleaner you is, the more respect you get, the more girls you get, you know. So a lot of people, they transition in this game that way. Very few people come, oh, I'm 17, I want to be a crip. And you put me on, that, that, that's, that's TV. 1988, I was nine years old, I was stabbed. So, uh, nine years old, I had to acquire 21 stitches. And, um, the dog started with a fight over that way right there. So we played around some of my older homeboys just coming me up to beat the dude up, beat the dude up. They end up stabbing me, man. You know what I mean? You know, I say about two weeks later, it was 1988. Gang life was kind of it was booming. And my uncle them come downstairs, man. Look, he took, he got a lot of stuff. He got stabbed. Like, I'm like, okay, I'm hard now. I took one for the team. Oh, I'm sure everybody my my bandage and stuff. Still a little blood on it and stuff. You know, it was like I say, it was 21. I mean, you know, it was 21 stitches on me. And uh, it was like it was crazy. And I was kind of pumped up. It, it pumped me up be this kind of other person in life, you know what I mean? And, you know, I've seen a lot of shit. My best friend got killed right in the room right now. I watched him get shot in the head, shot in the chest. And it's like, I, mean, I, I remember having dreams of it, like having flashbacks of the scene, reenacting the scenes like, man, a dude just shot my best friend. You know, my little brother got killed. I just see my little brother lay on the ground. You, you know, you grow up seeing a lot of things, uh, it's comparable to people see up in uh, in the war, you know what I'm saying, in other countries or something. It's, it's comparable to that, you know what I'm saying? So it take a real strong mind to like cope and deal with that type of stuff and block it up and, and make it a part of your life, your everyday lifestyle. I, I didn't like nothing. I didn't like nothing. I still don't really like nothing, but I'm learning to get over everything. But I didn't like nothing because I was I was hurting for my for my people. Once my people get hurt, once my people get scratched, hit, shot, stabbed, ran over, I'm hurting. So at that time, it was it was it was no tolerance. Every gang banger who got family and friends who died in gang violence. That's like, you know, that asking me, do I do I drink water? I, I got a long list. I don't want to put nobody in front of another. But trust me, the list is it's long. It's, it's very long. Very, very long. I and mean, there's some people died this year, some people died when I was 10 and 11. There's a lot of death going on, man. People die, people get shot, you know, going to jail. Uh, it, was, it was chaotic. And in my mind, I knew something had to change because I had a you know, homie named Carter. Uh, he got killed. He loved me to death. I was his big homie, and uh, I had just left him. One night before I got home, and then upstairs in the bed, my sister called me and said he just got killed. So I put my clothes back on, went back over there, and uh, he was dead in the street. I was like, wow. The next day, I had read to grab the newspaper, and the newspaper read that the average black man is dying before he gets 25 years old. And I got six sons. So they told me if I live to a certain age, I'm gonna witness my son's death. And Lord knows I don't want to see that, you know, because I love my boys. So I'm a God fearing man. So I asked the most highest, I said, what do I need to do? What's my part in this? Even when I was pregnant with my son Darion, rest in peace, uh, I was fighting, I was pregnant. I was on the line, bats, whatever, knives, whatever. Well, we go to your hood, we walk your hood and fight. 
You come over here, we go back over there, it was going back and forth. We were just burying people every every other week. It was out of control. People couldn't even go to school. We couldn't even go to Jordan High School. I think I'm me and about three or four of us was the only one because I didn't let them run me from Jordan High School. But the Grace Street ran Jordan down and the Jordan High School and they ran Markham. So we got a lot of people over here to get their education in the Pure Courts because of the violence in the community before the Peace Street. The origins of this war are well documented. The Crips, also known as the original Crip Homies, were founded in 1969 by Raymond Washington and Stanley Williams, leaders of two teenage gangs who united forces to strengthen their claim of the neighborhoods they lived in. Born out of poverty, segregation and a lack of opportunities, the teenagers prowled the streets robbing and stealing to create a reputation for themselves. The Bloods formed in retaliation, founded by Sylvester Scott and Benson Owens. These were students at Centennial High in Compton, where they had been attacked by the Crips. In time, the gangs swelled in membership, with different neighborhood gangs pledging allegiance to either side. Soon the rivalry incorporated the lucrative drug trade, and with the emergence of crack cocaine, territory was now more valuable than ever. Violence breeded violence, and the death toll steadily rose. In the late 80s and early 90s, the city of Los Angeles averaged 2.7 murders per day. It's estimated that over the last 45 years, 20,000 people have been killed in this war, with countless others caught up in the violence. In the midst of this chaos, one man made it his mission to counter this violence, to try and perpetuate a message of peace and reconciliation. Formerly a member of the Black Panther Party, Sheikh Mujahid Abdul Karim moved to LA, where he set up a business selling wigs. There he became friends with a Pakistani security guard who intrigued Mujahid with his character and tranquil nature. When probed, his friend said, Islam was the source of my well-being. Before long, Sheikh Mujahid began researching Islam, and in time, he converted to the religion. After practicing for some time, he became acquainted with a Persian man who was a follower of Shia Islam. Intrigued, the Sheikh wanted to know more about this path, as well as the revolution that was taking place in Iran at the time. His friend gave him the book, Hussein, Saviour of Islam, and when the Sheikh read the history of Karbala, he broke down in tears. He drew parallels with the struggle of his own people, who had suffered persecution for hundreds of years in America. However, in Karbala, it was the grandson of the Prophet who was killed, along with his family and companions. From that moment on, the Sheikh knew this was his path. He would go on to make it his mission to propagate the message of Imam Hussein, But not just to other Muslims, but to those who he felt were the most oppressed. And in his eyes, these were the people gripped by the gang violence in South Central LA. From 1978 to 1992, 14 years, I'm going out in the community. Uh, on, you know, I spent thousands of hours doing Dawa in the community. And uh, it was a situation that occurred in 1991. It was a young brother by the name of Henry Pico. And he was highly respected in the community. He was a tribe member from the Crips. And uh, when, when, he, when he assassinated him, the whole community rose up. And I read about it in the LA Times paper. I said, wow, this is the first time that I've ever seen tribes rise up for a killing. The truth came about because LAPD killed Henry Pico, Tiny. That's, and the power and the feeling why he laid on the ground, it was so powerful, you know, and uh, other people was going through the same thing. Chubb and then uh, Jordan Down got killed. Two people said I got shot in Jordan Down. Then um, my baby father had got shot in the Nickerson. But um, we were just tired of seeing police abuse. Police just coming, riding up, just beating the homies up, beating up fathers, mothers. I got beat up, my shoulder, 
my hand is messed up for the rest of my life. My nerves is gone because I was fighting with the police. They just rolled up and just didn't have no respect at that time when Gates was in charge of LAPD. It was out of control. They had no, no kind of respect for brown and black people. So immediately I went over in the community in the Imperial Courts and I said that uh, I read about what you all are doing. Uh, you know, uh, you had a big demonstration against uh, the police uh, killing of this brother. And uh, they said, yeah, we're forming a Henry Pico Justice Committee. I said, okay, I'll come and work on this committee. I said, I, I'm using reasoning and logic, forethought, that I said, wow, I work on this committee with them. Maybe I can win the influence, because I'm working with the Nicholson Gardens and the Jordan Downs Housing Project. I know the, the brothers that, uh, you know, can help put a peace movement together. And so I worked on that committee for about three months, and I was able to persuade a young brother, his street, they called him Sniper, uh, but uh, his real name was Dwayne Holmes. And I said, look, I'm working with the, the Nickerson and the Jordan Downs, and I said, look, brother, we got to come together. This, you know, we're not going to get anywhere unless we're united. So we, uh, I was able to get three brothers from each project, from the Nickerson, three from the Nickerson, three from the Jordan Downs, three from the Imperial Courts, brothers that had influence. The hood still won with it. We still won with it, you know, because of what the beef we had at the time with, uh, with the Great Street, so we still won with it. And um, we had to get uh, permission, which you need to do, because it's a protocol, the whole hood had to agree. No two people can't agree to run nothing for peace. But when Red Rooster came back, he came back from the Jordan Down saying, we need to meet, they with it. They with it the same day. And then that's when the father came. And then um, Dwayne and Red Rooster went to Serpo, Tony Bogard, A-Ball, and all the rest of the homies. And Big Smiley, Smiley went to the rest of the homies and then asked and started talking to all of us, the mothers and the sisters and the brothers in the community. And then he, he was going back and forth, just running back and forth all night trying to get us to buy into peace. And then one day, the minister popped up, and they said they got the PJs and the Nixons talking. And he, when he came up, he asked the homies, who can he talk to? Because that's what's going on. It was, they go find elementary. So he found me, and he said, who's the last me? He said, the Nixons PJs is, 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 is talking. What? I went to my castle, what y'all gonna do? They said, Ellie, we with you, man. We went so deep, we shocked you. Man, at least a hundred, at least a hundred, hundred of us showed up on Central at the mouth. And it was like, oh man, no, it's too many of y'all, so just bring back some reptiles. So we came back with about 25 people the next day. And we sat up in there, man, and, and it was like, what took us so long? You know what I mean? All this killing, all the people we done sent to the grave and to the penitentiary. That's all we had to do was come and talk. Brother Majai came over here, uh, since he's Muslim, you know, he don't, he don't have no alliance to nobody, so he can come in this project, that project, this project, and then he came in with something new, Islam, Islam that lets you think for yourself. So as you think for yourself, you know that's not, you know, just, that's not where you're supposed to live. We didn't allow anyone in that had any kind of weapon, knife or gun, so we would search each brother. Uh, and uh, so we would just sit down and just talk to get, you know, familiar with one another, the brothers were the, uh, amongst themselves. And uh, we never had a, a really a problem. I, I don't know, it was, it was just the hand of Allah. Let me just say that. I, it, it was the hand of Allah to bring about some semblance of tranquility, you know, amongst. I, that's why I say it, was, it was Allah that brought this together. Because we, we didn't ever have no incident where brothers had an, that showed animosity while they were having the meetings in the masjid. You know, and these brothers have fought for almost 25, 30 years, killing one another. You know, when, before we started meeting, a lot of us was hesitant to do it because it's been a lot of hurt and pain. I had a little brother, my little brother's name is Lil Hitman, you know what I'm saying? He was shot by the Gray Streets back in the days by uh, a guy named Baby Bam from Gray, right? He was shot, right? And when the peace treaty started, I ran into the guy who shot my little brother. You know, he thought it was going to be some funk because he came to the meet. You know what I'm saying? But I looked him dead in the eye. I said, man, look, that's, that's no problem. That's done and over with. You know what I'm saying? We're trying to get peace now. You know what I'm saying? So when the peace came, me and him ended up being 
the best of friends once it all happened and cracked. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's a lot of war stories. My homies got, you know, all of us got a little, little war story of what we went through for as gang banging in the neighborhood, you know what I'm saying? But the thing is, you know what I'm saying, it's peace around here among us now, but we need the peace to come back with all projects. You know what I'm saying? This wall is a symbol. If you look, it says, nobody can stop this, stop the, this war but us. You know what I'm saying? Even though it's stopped for right now, who knows what can happen in the near future? Mike can come back. So that's one of the reasons why we never, you know, painted over this 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 monument right here. You know what I'm saying? It was so much joy because Crips and Bloods for the first time together. It made it, it was sweet. It, it was sweet for a while, you know, because ain't nobody dying, and it's way better if you're homeboy than getting shot at. And at that moment and at that time, it slowed a whole lot down where we all can be happiness and our kids can play. And we can walk up and down the street and our parents and have no, you know what I'm saying, no worries and nothing like that. And as far as like the police, it was slowed down, tied down, gone. And uh, yeah, man, so. And mind you that I never gave a tribe or leader one penny because I didn't have no money myself. I never gave them out a single penny to come, to sit down, because I don't want to be a part of no movement that you have to pay the people to come to sit to stop killing one another. Well, if the money dissipate, then everybody leave, you know? So this is why the truce is still holding. We got many brothers now, not only in this community at once, but all over the city pushing uh, the peace movement. And uh, the, the, the black on black killing, it's been cut at least two thirds in the city of LA. Los Angeles because of the peace movement we have here. It was really historical. You know, some brothers, when, when this truce happened, brothers that had formerly killed one another, they began to hug and kiss each other on the cheek and weep and cry. I mean, brothers that was killing people, you know, that uh, they, they submitted, you know, alhamdulillah. It, it, was, it was a milestone in the, in the history of the uh, African-American people. After years of fighting, with thousands of people killed, maimed and incarcerated, the heads of each gang couldn't quite believe how fruitful the meetings had become. Everyone knew that peace was ultimately in their own hands, and that peace was more valuable than any gains made on the basis of turf or the sale of drugs. That realisation brought with it a new dawn, a rebirth. In this way, the community felt indebted to the efforts of Sheikh Mujahid. He had been with them promoting coexistence for years, but only now was it coming to its complete fruition. He never gave up on them. He could quite easily have moved to another community, but through his perseverance over a period of 14 years, the community had finally realized there was another way. Well, Brother Bajahi, he literally, if it wasn't for him, it wouldn't be no truth. If he wasn't living, it would have never been no truth. It probably would have been one later. Somebody else probably came along. But what came about, how I heard, I was gangbanging then. Food. When the truth started in 92, you know, by then I'm grown. I'm fresh out the pen, you know, fresh out of penitentiary. And, you know, he was meeting with brothers. From Nick Sims, like my homeboy elementary, uh, he was meeting with certain people, you know, key people from different projects trying to get the peace thing together. But at the same time, back then, the gang, the violence rate was high, super high. Game banging was it, it was it's serious, a lot serious than people think. Cause a lot of people lost loved ones by then. By '92, I lost at least too many loved ones from the other side, and vice versa. You know, we want the peace, and, and, and luckily, Bajahi made it happen. He brought the sense of structure because we was just wilding out, fighting the police, getting drunk, smoking Sherman, getting high. And then he was like, no, that's not the way to do it. You know, he came to different to the different hoods, running down Imperial, Nickerson, and Hacienda, and all over the one ways, all over Watts, to tell us to do it the right way, how we can start business and really start bringing stuff together more in a peaceful way. You don't have to go keep fighting the police, because we was fighting the police when Tiny got killed, because we was angry. 
And then that's when he went to all the community and said, we all need to come together. Since I was a kid, I used to see him around here. So as I got older, I saw like I never knew what what he what he was like or who was he like. I used to always see him. So I was like when I got older and I seen yeah. him like hey like because you always dressed down. You always I'm like who is that guy? So when I got older and I introduced him myself, he already knew who I was. I'm like hey, you already know. He's like yeah man, you know I, I raised your daddy, Big Will. You know you know yeah you little Will. So that relationship grew right there and the bond came good. You know he always been a mentor to me. He always gave me you know me. Uh, a sense of direction. If I'm telling him I'm going through something, he say, you know, pray about it, brother. Do this, do that, you know. And and he always helped me. If I, I I need help with anything, he always there for me. And I'm grateful for that. When I began to work in the community here, they used to put guns on me. They throw water on me. You know, just like they preached the Holy Prophet in Mecca. They would, you know, disrespected him. I, I remember one night. It was close to sunset. And uh, I was talking to about 15 of the bloods, and the, they call the bounty hunters, blood tribe. And uh, uh, all of them walked away. And one black brother uh, from the bloods, uh, gang member, he said, I don't like you. I said, why? Why don't you like, did I do any harm to you? Did I, what did I do? He said, I just don't like you. And so he put his gun out, put, it, put his finger on the trigger, and uh, I did, and I'd, I'd been to walk away from him uh, to get into my car, and I wouldn't turn my back to him because he probably would have shot me in the back. But I faced him and, to go to my car, and I got in my car and, and went on. But uh, later, uh, the next day, one of the brothers that knew him very well, they said, uh, you are blessed. You are a lucky person. They said he never pulled a gun on anyone and didn't shoot him. Sheikh Mujahid is my revolutionary uncle revolutionary. I, I, my, my teacher and him are very close. They've been in the struggle. Like I'm saying, I, I've been in struggle for 30 years. I've known him as long as I've been a Muslim. He's been pushing the line. He's one of the first Mosh G's, independent, independent of the system. He's, he, he, he wasn't financed by Saudi Arabia. He wasn't financed to jump through hoops or anything. He's been here basically by himself and it's an honor to serve with the brother. He goes where a lot of people do not go, where a lot of people scared to go. You got a lot of Muslims who say that they're not scared of the devil, but they're scared to come to the ghetto. They're scared to come face black people. They're scared to come amongst actually baked Muslims in the ghetto. So what he means to me is resistance and resilience and vigilance in the ghetto for the actually baked. Muslims was the driving force to help us get this peace treaty started. Mujahid is like a father to everybody around here. You know what I'm saying? We all look up to him, we respect him with full credibility and everything. He's the father a lot of us never had. He's good, he's a good person, you know, he's a Muslim. He opened up the doors and let us hold our peace treaty meetings up in the Masjid, you know? And, you know, all credit go to Mujahid because he was the main backbone to make it happen. In this community, California, it's about it's tribalism with the gang banging. So whether they're Bullas or Crip, Sheikh Mujahid is able to, just because that he's Muslim, he's able to get them together, to work together and do stuff in the community. And that is a beautiful thing. Not too many people can walk up with just a normal guy. You can't walk up into a blood neighborhood and say, oh, I want you to come work with these dudes over here in the Jordan Downs because they're Crips. You see what I'm saying? I want you to work with this other set over here because they're other Crips and y'all Bloods. A lot of people can't do that, you know what I'm saying? But Mujahid is one of the ones that they give him that respect, you know what I'm saying? If they are doing what they're doing, they're not going to disrespect him. They're going to come together and be like, hey, Mujahid said, let's do it. Let's go. Let's go to the masjid and do it, you know? So he plays a very important role in the community. He's always, if uh, it's been a lot of brothers getting killed over here in different communities, He's always there with the rest of the brothers and sisters to support the family or at the police department. Anything that he can do in a community, I know he's always been there. Propagating Islam is, is very important because if you don't have no spiritual foundation, you're, it's just like building your house on quicksand. So that was my main perspective is for, to uh, propagate Islam to the people. Also that you, we have to be politically organized too because the Holy Prophet of Allah, he didn't just preach the, the deen, uh, you know, Islam. It, it, 
politics is 50% of Islam. You cannot do, it's like the glove in the hand, you know? So I approach them from that perspective, whereas most Christian ministers talk to them, they only about Jesus died for your sins and you can do what you want to do and you can go to heaven. But Islam, no, you're responsible for what you do. And I always emphasize that too, you are responsible for what they do. Me, I'm not here to make you no Muslim. I, only Allah can do that. And so, and also they, 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 they saw in me that, uh, that uh, I didn't have no fear in my heart, uh, you know, from the, the enemies of Allah. And so that impressed them. And uh, I would go to their house, sit down in their house, talking with them. They'd have, you know, liquor in their house or maybe drugs in their house. But what am I to do? If I don't go to them, then I will, they weren't going to come to me. I had to go out and make a relationship with them to win their, you know, to win them, uh, their, their, you know, to win their thinking. Uh, because they know if you care about them, anyone know if you care about them or not. And they know I have love in my heart for my oppressed brothers and sisters, and I would do whatever I could do. So this is the message that I preached was, was uh, to, you know, have firm faith in Allah, to, to, to pray, to fast. I would, you know, go out propagating all these issues, but I was also about politics. You know, you have rights as a human being. You have a right not to be oppressed. You have a right to life, liberty, justice, and equality that you have to stand up on your rights. You cannot let nobody, you know, deprive you of your rights. Uh, Allah said in the Quran Kareem that oppression is worse than slaughter. You know, it's, oppression is worse than slaughter. So, I, and so alhamdulillah, you know, it took many, many years. It took me 14 years to win their confidence. I mean, uh, you mean thousands and thousands of hours of work in the community. And I had to be one with them. You know, I didn't say uh, because I don't drink, smoke, you, no Muslim, no good Muslim is going to be doing something like that. And so, but whatever they did, that's on them and Allah. I'm not going to browbeat the people because you might drink liquor or this, this or that. One day they might grow up and, you know, become a, a good uh, convert to Islam. We look at the situation of Malcolm X. He was a, a very uh, beautiful example how he was... Uh, pimping women, he was selling drugs, he was using drugs, drinking liquor, eating pig. We all experienced that before we became Muslim. And look what Allah made him do, made him as, as a shining light to the Muslims, African-American Muslims, and also Muslims around the world read his autobiography, how he transcended from being a hoodlum, a drug addict, a pimp, and became a you know, strong, good Muslim and he became a martyr, you know, and uh, alhamdulillah that, uh, so this is my strategy that I, I, when, I come, when I came to watch, I didn't just come here to just to put a mask in, in the community to be with poor people. I mean, it's poor people all around the, this, this country. No, I came here with a blueprint, a plan, that first you gotta go to the people that's most oppressed, the down and out, the, the barefoot, the naked, the oppressed, really oppressed. So this is what Watts is. Watts is a historical uh, community also. It's always was known for the people, they would stand up to demand their rights and be ready to die, you know, to get their rights. So this was the strategy I used. I said, well, if we can get this area organized, it would have an impact upon the city and across America. And, and Hamdur Dasu in 1992, it had a powerful impact. It was so powerful that, uh, uh, president George Bush was president in 1992, George Bush Sr. And he sent 100 FBI agents to LA to investigate. It was in the LA Times paper. He sent 100, he didn't send them no FBI agents when they were killing one another. <laughs> Why didn't they send them then when they're killing one another? You know, if you send them at all. No, he sent them after the truce was organized. Peace, the young guys said, we're not killing each other no more. The mosque was always seen as a part of the Watts community, but after the truce, it became an example, a shining light for what could be achieved by bringing the people together. People that had fought for decades, now reconciling and working side by side to better their lives. Beyond that, the masjid was a place where the doors were always open. 
If people had any needs, they knew the mosque and Sheikh Mujahid would welcome them with no strings attached. In that way, people naturally became attracted to Islam. They saw a belief system which didn't discriminate, a complete way of life where they found logical answers with no contradictions. And what's more, Islam provided spiritual growth and healing, something so vital in a community that had seen so much bloodshed. In this way, people found a real sense of purpose and belonging, because too often the attraction to gang life comes down to that need to be part of something greater. I mean, Islam is the reason why we came together. If we didn't have Islam, we wouldn't have been able to do this in 92. Islam was the vehicle and the mosque was the place where brothers felt safe to have a conversation, safe where, you know, because everybody was bringing guns and stuff and didn't trust each other. And so Islam brought trust into the equation. Brother Majahu, not just him, uh, Brother Tony Muhammad, a lot of the Muslim brothers, they've been coming down for a long time now. Back when I was a kid, like in the mid-80s, you know what I mean? They've been coming around to try to do a lot of positive things, you know? Give away for the kids and different things, bringing job opportunities around, you know? Helping bring the gangs together, it's a lot. Yeah. Back to school programs, uh, backpacks, uh, books, uh, <laughs> Or, or haircuts, free haircuts, you know, things like that for our youth, like, you know what I'm saying? So that brings a whole lot of attention to the families that was, was unfortunate, you know what I'm saying? Like shoes, uh, you know, everything that comes with, with, with going back to school, and that was appreciated too, because a whole lot of people wasn't forcing me to go to school with nice haircuts, nice shirts, nice, you know what I'm saying? So with free haircuts, with free backpacks, with free pencils and shoes and stuff, that getting back to school, so that was a good appreciation too. I, anybody that I talk to that I've known a male that's been in the prison, first thing that they talk about is Mujahid Masjid, coming to the Masjid when they get out. Even if they only know a little bit about Islam. I had a brother that called, um, my husband is incarcerated right now, that called and he wanted to know the address to the Masjid because he heard about Sheikh Mujahid. And uh, so I gave him the, the address to the Masjid. So it's a lot of, he does a lot in the community and it's beneficial, you know, for the people because like I said, it's not too many people. And if you can get Bloods and Crips to come together and they're practicing Islam as well and everybody else, it, it's beautiful, you know, and it won't, you know, hopefully, like I said, Islam is a universal peaceful thing. Hopefully everybody become Muslim. That's my overall goal. That's why I said, I'm studying in the houses so that I could teach the sisters in prison and the sisters on the street about Islam. Islam gave us that structure and gave us that God, gave us the path, the way to live, the, the righteous life. So that's why we converted over to Islam. Sure, converted over to Islam, you know what I mean? And at the same time, uh, Majaya is just incredible, you know what I mean? He put it in our face, he showed me, he showed me the difference between letting people think for me and me thinking for myself. So as I think for myself, I ain't a follower or nothing. I do what I want to do. I, I live the way I allow it to for me to live in my own heart. I was in a turbulent time in my life. I got, um, I got railroaded by the system, so I had time to think about it. And uh, at that time, a lot of the music that I was listening to early 1990s rap was gearing people towards Islam. So it made me start picking up books and reading. And it made me, once I start seeing certain lies or the inconsistencies of Christianity, the Bible, the contradictions. Because I, I, I've, I've had 12 years of Catholic school, Catholicism, Francescanism and all that type of stuff. So when I seen, began to see Islam, and some people were relating Islam through the Bible, which I was familiar with, they got me to Islam. And really, when I found out that Islam was the religion of my particular forefathers, the Moors, the Africans, it made sense for me to revert back to Islam and abdicate and throw away Christianity, Judeo-Christianity. Being in the streets of South Central Los Angeles, uh, I lost my way. I became uh, involved in gangs, um, gang banging, and um, uh, all the things that come along with that, the violence, the hurt, the pain. And uh, during that time, I, um, I ended up going to prison uh, for 15 years. And uh, while I was in prison, I went through so-called Orthodox Islam, Sunni Islam. And maybe my sixth year, I ran into uh, a brother named Mujahid, ironically. 
and he gave me a book called Then I Was Guided, you know, and I read the book and it all made sense to me. I began to ask questions and being that the our Sunni brothers are the dominant uh, Muslim community in there, uh, they ostracized me. A lot of it because of ignorance. They didn't know just what they were told. Uh, at that time, uh, Wahhabism was very fluent and prevalent in there. <coughs> and um, I got into a little conflict. Short story long, I was sent to a place where it was predominantly Shia Muslims. And uh, that's been how I began my journey to learn about the Ahlul Bayt and uh, uh, Islamic history, true Islamic history. And I just gravitated towards it. I, I came into Islam about 11 months ago. Um, what, what really led me into Islam was the Bible itself. Um, I, I study my Bible really, really carefully. Um, when I actually, when I actually started to accept Islam, the belief into my heart was when I started acknowledging certain parts in the Bible where it talks about a, a certain man who is unlettered, um, you know, things like that. One one day I, I had a cell phone. I downloaded Quran. I read it. Uh, I, there was a whole lot of information in there that I said to myself, there is no way that, you know, the Prophet, be and blessings be upon him, made, made it up. Um, from there on, I started, I actually started looking hard for a masjid. I found a bunch of masjids, but the way I saw it is that I, 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 I found them, but it wasn't like God led me to these masjids, so I made a I made a, a, a real sincere prayer to, to Almighty God to help me find a message around here where I live. And one thing led to another, I ended up discovering this beautiful message. I ended up making my Shahada here 11 months ago and yeah, it's been, it's been really beautiful ever since. When I was a young boy, like 19 years old, I was confined to prison for 18 years with a life term. Um, through my research, trying to figure out who I am as a young African American, um, historically I started delving into the history books and found Islam. Um, Alhamdulillah, I read the book Hussein, the Savior of Islam, and that was my starting point of a journey. His suffering got me to the point where I went like, wow, this, this guy just left everything behind for, for God. And I was always a person that was spiritual um, as a Christian, of course. Um, my whole family was background Christianity. Um, so I had an idea who God was and that concept, you know, wrong and, and don't do right. I mean, don't do wrong, but do right. But unfortunately, I had relocated to a different community. And I left Florida, my hometown. That's where I was, my, my origin, I was raised at, to LA, California, and it was, it was all bad. So I moved into a community where it was very um, impoverished, gang infested, drugs, you know, prostitution. And my father left me at 10 years old, he left me. So I went to the streets for closure, trying to figure out you know, um, how to be a man. And all the, I think the distractions in the community, the fast cars, the, the women, uh, me being 10 years old, I was allured by that. Um, joined the gang at 10 years old. So um, in that, type of choice that I made that was really um, a very dangerous choice because I joined that gang and um, I was shot three times at the age of 13 or 14 years old. Um, I almost got paralyzed as a young boy. Um, so God, Alhamdulillah, He spared me. You know, and still in just engulfed in that madness of gang activity, I still continued that path of destruction. So um, Alhamdulillah, Allah put me in, in this engine in prison for 18 years just for, I think, for me to contemplate and just define myself. And in there, that's when I started reading about who I was. Um, as a young boy, I never had an um, idea about African-American history in school. I read like two pages about African-American, that was it. So I was able to, um, I think, engender a little self-hatred. I've read about European um, culture, history. I'm like, man, why is nothing about black? So when I asked my teacher in, in ninth grade, you know, why we don't teach African-American history? 
he got real mad, just turned red to me at the classroom, you little thug, you know, this is that. And that kind of hit me hard in my steam. Like, I just asked a question. I want to know about myself, basically. So that self-hatred led me to doing a lot of things. My father's disappearance, I just went to the streets and landed in prison for 18 years with a life term. And then there I started reading books, as I mentioned earlier, um, and I found Imam Hussein. And that gave me an idea that I want to follow this man who gave everything up for God. And that was my, start, my starting point to be a Muslim. And that was 1994, alhamdulillah. I haven't looked back since then. So he inspired me to be the man I am today, is to be disciplined, to love God, and to sacrifice, you know, and to resist oppression. So that's just my whole um, life is fighting for uh, the people who suppress. You know, now I'm here. Family, I have family members that is Jehovah Witness, uh, Muslim, but we didn't really associate them revolutionaries and uh, Baptists and Christian. So they, once I told them I wanted to be Muslim, it was kind of, you know, with the Jehovah Witness family, they didn't really accept me, but I didn't care. So I just went on about my way and continued to become a uh, Muslim with me and my children because I'm a mother of 12 children. So I didn't care what they said. The Jehovah Witness, different religions of my families, I had went to church and I went to the Kingdom Hall and it just was something that was not all the way true there or not all the way right to me. So I couldn't never, like how they say, get baptized. My mother, my aunties and all them, they were Jehovah's Witness, they wanted me to get baptized. I'm like, no, I need to know certain answers before I do that. And when I asked the brother the questions, it, everything just seemed mystical, it didn't seem real. So I never, um, you know, joined the Jehovah's Witnesses. Then when I met uh, Sister Nisa and what she was telling me about the Prophet Muhammad, and the Quran, she showed me the Quran and I read it for myself, but then it felt more down to earth, more connected to me, opposed to even to all those years that I was practicing Jehovah Witness or different stuff, but that Islam felt more uh, at peace of what I, you know what I'm saying, that I could relate to more. So ever since then, I've been a Muslim. Now I am a two-year student at the Hauser. I'm the only woman student at the Hauser because my plan is to be able to go inside the women jails and in a community and teach other sisters about Islam. But in order to do that, I need to be learned fully. So this is my second year in the house and I'm the only woman. I, I love the kids, they know me, huh? Y'all love me, huh? <laughs> you know, I'm good with the kids, you know. You know, I, you know, I see them every time. I, I try to give them a dollar. I give them good advice. You know what I'm saying? Make sure they get the school safe and all that stuff. You know. So it's 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 it's. Of course, about we... the kids now. When, when I grew up, my name is Lil Will. I grew up gang banging. You know, fighting with. I wasn't part of the peace treaty. My area, we wasn't part of the peace treaty. My older generation was. So my area, I grew up fighting against the great streets and the imperial courts. You know. So me going through that, it was it was rough, you know. We had our wins, we had our losses, you know. So going through that struggle, now I don't want that for our next generation. So I try to show the kids better, how to lead them in a different direction, you know, because I sacrificed myself already for they can have something better. A brighter future. Yeah, I don't want the kids to go through what I went through. Yeah, I do worry about their well-being and their future. That's why I try to put my all into making a better future for them around here. I don't want them to grow up through the, the situations that I grew up in, through the, the gang banging, the violence, and the police brutality and all that. Nah, well, I try my best. I look at the kids every day and pray, my, pray that I can do something to make it better for them. Man, gang life is real wicked. It's wicked, you know what I'm saying? Y'all don't understand, like a lot of people don't understand, they don't know the real deep dark side of it, like, you know what I'm saying? It ain't always your enemies that's gonna kill you, you know what I'm saying? It could be a dude that you grew up with, you know what I'm saying? Y'all ate cereal, played marbles with or whatever, like, you know what I'm saying? You know, so I just say for them, you know, kids growing up don't ever think about joining gang. Know that, you know, have the knowledge of what the gang is about or whatever, not, but don't join it, you know what I'm saying? You can, whatever you think you need a crowd to do, you don't need that, you know what I'm saying? You can you can handle your own self, you know what I mean? Your own self, you know what I mean? You defend yourself or self or whatever on your own. You don't need no gang, no, no mob or none of that, you know what I mean? You know, gangs is I wish I never would have did that. I could have 
hopefully been in the NFL or something like that or whatever, but due to the gang life, this is where I'm at right now. We lost a lot of people due, due to gang welfare. I lost two kids in 60 days. Not only that, um, my daughter's father was killed in 97 by LAPD. But I took my anger and, and did positive things. I took the passion I had, the anger I had, I was angry. And I'm still kind of angry. But I had started getting out the home. I built a prison in my home. Started coming out and started getting involved and saying, what could, how could I change? How could I change what's going on in the community, save another life? So that's what we're doing. I, I do this, this work because I love Allah. You know, my life, my death is for Allah. Uh, you know, you, no human being can give me all the money in the heavens and on earth, you know, to, to change my, this course of action. Like when the Holy Prophet of Allah, he said, that if you give me the sun in my, red, in my right hand and you give me the moon in my left hand, I will never deviate from my mission. You know, I'm determined. If I get killed, alhamdulillah, I become martyred. If I live, alhamdulillah, it's all in the hands of Allah. And I love the oppressed peoples. I don't care if you're black, you're brown, you're red, you're white. That's irrelevant to me. I have to work in the black community because they're more familiar with Islam, you know. And so, but, but I love all oppressed people and I want to do whatever I can while I'm living, you know, I'm 72 years old. I'll be 73 uh, December the 26th of, of this year. I don't have a lot of more years. Only Allah, my, my life and my death is in the hands of Allah. But while I'm living on this earth, I'm a, every bone in my body, every drop of blood in my body is to help the cause of Allah, to help the oppressed people, especially inside of America, because this is a superpower. America rules or dominate the world. They're so arrogant, proud, and boastful that they can just do what they want to. Even with Iraq, they said, we should have took all the oil. It belonged to us. How can they think like this in, the, in Palestine? That's the Palestinian land. Do we not have any sympathy toward it for the Palestinian people? We have to liberate the masjid there. It's control. We can't even get in. If, you've, if you're under 40, you can't even enter the masjid in Palestine. What has happened to the Muslims? What has happened to the Muslims? You know? How? They, they uh, allow these things to happen. Syria is almost gone, it's almost destroyed. Yemen, Iraq, Afghanistan, all you, anywhere you, Nigeria, all the, the Muslims they're killing up there. Ibrahim, Imam, Ibrahim Zagzaki, they tried to kill him, killed hundreds of his followers. They tried to assassinate him and his wife. All he's propagating. Is, is a, a peaceful Islamic movement and standing up uh, for the Palestinian people in Palestine. They have Quds demonstration. Every year they have Quds demonstration. They kill his sons, six of his sons, you know, just because they want to help support the Palestinian people. So what are we going to do as Muslims? We can just sit and be quiet and people just live in their comfortable houses, drive their Mercedes Benzes and stash their monies up under the pillow or up, uh, under the mattress or in the banks and just forget about the oppressed people. No, that's no Islam. That's no Islam. That's not following the, the prophets of Allah. That's not following Ahlu Bayt. They stood up uh, for the oppressed people. So Alhamdulillah, I just pray to Allah that um, he keep in my heart, uh, you know, that I always be on the path of Imam Ali and Imam Hussein and all the Ahlul Bayt. Is, there's an old saying, a proverb in Islam, it says that uh, live like Ali, but die like Hussein. <laughs>